Come in, sir. I beg you. May I take your case? I shall hold on to it for the moment, if I may, Mr Holder. Would do us great honour. It's just that I'm not sure what... To... Simply, Mr Holder, a matter of £50,000 for four days. A trifling sum many of my friends would oblige me with, but personal obligation in my case. Well, I... Indeed, and if my own purse at the moment were able to stand the strain... However, that means the firm, which means safeguarding my partner. Of course. Now, you may take the case, Mr Holder, and open it if you'd be so kind. My dear sir. Sufficient safeguard, Mr Holder? Good. I see it is. The Beryl Coronet by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Dramatised for radio by Vincent McInerney. With Clive Merrison as Sherlock Holmes and Michael Williams as Dr John Watson. And featuring Anthony Newlands as Alexander Holder and Angus Wright as his son Arthur. The Beryl Coronet. One crisp, sunny February morning, I was standing in our bow window at 221B Baker Street, looking down on yesterday's snow, when my attention was taken by the eccentric conduct of a gentleman coming our way from the direction of the Metropolitan Station. About 50, tall, portly and imposing, with a massive, strongly marked face and commanding figure. He was running hard, with occasional little springs into the air, such as a weary man gives who is unaccustomed to set any tax upon his legs. The whole thing was so out of the way, I felt obliged to bring it to the attention of my companion, sitting behind me in his armchair. Holmes, hmm? here is a madman coming along. Oh, poor fellow. <clears throat> that his relatives should allow him to come out alone. Uh, that Watson depends on where he is coming to. Why, he's looking up at the number of the houses near us. I rather believe because he is looking for this one. I think I recognise the symptoms. And even as Holmes spoke, the man, puffing and blowing, rushed at our door and pulled the bell until the whole house resounded with the clanging. And a few minutes later, entered our room. Holmes immediately went to him, pushed him into an easy chair, and sitting beside him began to chat in those easy, soothing tones which he knew so well how to employ. You have come to tell me your story, have you not? But are fatigued with your haze. Now, pray wait until you've recovered, and I will only be too happy to look at uh, any little problem which you may submit to me. Hmm? Uh, a glass of water, perhaps? Uh, yes, 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 a glass of water would help. Uh, Watson, would you, old fellow? Of course. You are, sir. Small sips, I think, for the moment. Uh, Watson, I should add, sir, is a medical man, late of the Indian Army, and my friend and confidant. Yes, the police told me I would find him here with you, Mr Holmes, and that he was completely trustworthy. Oh, indeed. Now, Mr Holmes, you doubt you think me mad? Yeah, I see you've had some great trouble. God knows. <laughs> Public disgrace and private affliction. It up to now never a stain on my character. And, and that is not all. The very noblest in the land may suffer too. Unless some way is found out of this horrible affair. Then pray, sir, let me have a clear account of both who you are and what has befallen you. Uh, my name is Alexander Holder of Holder and Stevenson Threadneedle Street. Name may be familiar to you. The second largest banking concern in the whole of London, I believe. As you are right, Dr. Watson. Though where it will stand tomorrow. However, yesterday morning, then, I was seated in my office when a card was brought into me by one of the clerks. I started when I saw the name. One which I feel I cannot divulge even here and ordered its bearer to be asked to enter immediately. He did so, 
carrying a black Morocco case and with the air of a man who wishes to hurry quickly through a disagreeable task. To wit, the securing of a loan of £50,000 for four days. He pointed out that he could borrow such a trifling sum ten times over from his friends, but that he felt it was unwise to place himself under personal obligation. I, for my part, responded that I would be more than happy to advance it from my own purse, but that, unfortunately, it just would not bear the strain. My noble visitor accepted the implication that the money would therefore have to come from the firm against collateral, and he put forward the Morocco case. Inside was the beryl coronet. Why, that means... It is one of the most precious possessions of the Empire. Precisely. A circlet of chased gold set with 39 enormous beryls, which, as you know, are related to emeralds, the lowest estimate of its worth would be twice the sum asked. Mm. You had no qualms about an article of such inestimable public interest being given into your safekeeping? Not initially. I immediately locked the coronet in my private safe until close of business. Then, about to go home, I recalled that bankers' safes have been forced before now. So I ordered a cab had myself escorted into it and drove the eight or so miles to Streatham. The Morocco case containing the coronet on my knee and my heart in my mouth every inch of the way. You travelled via London Bridge? Fearing it would collapse under me at any moment. And when you arrived home? Immediately locked the case into an old bureau that stands in my dressing room. Hmm. And then? Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, I, I wonder if I might talk for a short while about my household. My groom and page sleep out of the house and can be set aside altogether. I have three tried and trusted older maid servants and one younger girl, Lucy Parr, who has been with me only a few months but who came with an excellent character and has given complete satisfaction. She is, however, very pretty and has admirers who sometimes hang about the place. There is one at the moment? A local tradesman, I believe, the greengrocer, one Frank Prosper. Frank yeah, Prosper, I see. Ah, please continue. Which brings me to my own immediate family. I am a widower, as you may have guessed, with an only son, Arthur. Tell us about him, Mr. Holmes. He has been a disappointment to me, a grievous disappointment, though I, I lay the blame at my own door. You see, when my wife died, he became everything to me. I could not bear to see the smile fade from his small, shining face for even a moment. So he asked and I gave, with predictable but distressing results. Why, uh, Mr. Holder, we are not far now, I think. Your clarity is excellent. Your narrative arresting your audience eager prey. Do continue. Yes, of course. Arthur. It was naturally my intention he should succeed me in my business. But he was not of a business turn. There were large sums of money he would have been required to handle had he come into the firm if I make myself clear. Mm. But he is a good lad at heart and so popular, which, unfortunately, when he was younger, led him to be invited to join an aristocratic gaming club. There, purses were long, habits expensive, play deep, and his skill at cards insufficient at which point he would turn to me for help. Would you afford it him? How could I refuse? At least until like, the cause of it all is Sir George Burnwell. Uh -huh. Arthur has never 
been the same since he met him. Yet when the man comes to the house, I can hardly resist him myself. Mary, too, feels this time. I'm sure, having seen the way she studies him. Mary? My adoptive niece, my dead brother's child, a sunbeam, Mr. Holmes. Ah, if only she and Arthur. Who knows? Had she accepted Arthur's suit, things may not have transpired as they did. There are so many possible permutations, Mr. Holmes, so many... Pray, Mr. Holder, what were these things? Of course. That evening, then, I locked the coronet in my bureau, as I've told you, and I went down to dinner. Afterwards, taking coffee in the drawing room, I told Arthur and Mary my experience and of the precious treasure we had under our roof, suppressing only the name of our client. Lucy Power, who had brought the coffee, had, I'm sure, left the room, but I, I cannot swear that the door was closed. Mary and Arthur were much interested and wanted to see the coronet, but I decided not to disturb it. And Arthur asked me where I had put it. I told him in the bureau in my dressing room, at which he laughed and intimated that the bureau could be opened with almost any key in the house. This, this wild way of talking unsettled me and I decided to retire. Arthur, however, insisted in accompanying me upstairs and followed me into my bedroom. Final effort, I assume, to persuade me to show him the coronet. Instead, however, it was just one more request for help. And, as I say, I was very tired. Two hundred pounds and the third time this month! Sir George Burnwell again, I suppose. Among others. Dad. No, Arthur, not Dad. Not this time. Heaven knows I have been generous, thinking if I indulged you for a while, you would eventually come to your senses and give up your high play out of duty and shame. But that is obviously not to be. Yes, you've been very kind. More than kind. And believe me, I am as sick of appealing to you as you are of hearing me. But I must have this money. Otherwise, I can never show my face in the club again. I assure you, it has come to that. Which is the best reason of all not to give it to you. Well, I agree. But it would mean I leave a dishonoured man, and this you surely cannot want. Dad, just this once. Then I give you my word, I will quit the place of my own accord and will study finance with a view to joining the firm. You have my solemn word as a gentleman. Will you, Dad? Just once more. And how would your friend Sir George feel about you dropping him and his set? I think Sir George has almost completed the business that brings him to this house. And I have no more money to lose to him. No, I do not think my resigning from the club will greatly distress Sir George. Well, Arthur, you are persuasive. But it is a melody that I have heard too many times. I am sorry, my boy, but you get no more money from me to settle your debts. Not a farthing. Now, good night. Sir. At which gentleman he made me a bow and quietly left. It must have been very hard for you. Very hard. For I would give up my life for him if needs be. But I could not bear to go on financing the eventual death in life to which his profligate ways were leading him. What do you think he meant in his reference to Sir George Burnwell? I have no idea, Mr. Holmes, and I was too distressed to consider it at that time. I suppose it was something to the effect that, having bled my son dry, Sir George would now be off looking to find another gull. Hmm. And what happened then? Something prompted me to check the house was secure for the night. Duty I usually leave to Mary, but what with... Of course. So I came out of my room and started down the stairs. As I did so, I saw Mary herself at the side window of the hall, which she closed and fastened as I approached and then came to meet me. Looking, I felt quite disturbed. Uncle, I did not expect to see you. I thought tonight, my child, I would look around myself. What with the coronet being on the premises? Yes, of course. Uh, did I see you at the hall window then, my dear? Nothing untoward happening outside, I hope. Why, I did hear a noise. Tell me, Uncle, did you give Lucy leave to go out tonight? Certainly not. She came in just now by the back door. 
She has no doubt only been to the side gate to see someone. But, as you say, what with... But you were quite right. It's far too late for such goings on. I'll, I'll speak to her in the morning. Now, are you sure everything is fastened? Quite sure. But I will recheck if you wish. No, no, no. Your word is good enough. As it always is. So, good night, my child. Good night. Good night, Uncle. I am endeavouring to tell you everything, Mr. Holmes, that may have any bearing on the case, but I beg you, question me on any point I do not make clear. On the contrary, your statement is singularly lucid. Good. For now, I come to a part of my story in which I should wish it to be particularly so. I'm not a very heavy sleeper, and what with the anxiety in my mind, the fact is that about two in the morning I was awakened by some sound in the house which left an impression that a window had been closed somewhere. Suddenly, to my horror, I heard distinctly the soft padding of feet in my dressing room. I threw the covers back and quietly opened the connecting door. The gas was half up, the bureau was open. My son, Arthur, dressed only in shirt and trousers, was standing holding the coronet in both hands. He appeared to be attempting simultaneously to both wrench and bend it. I cried out and he dropped it. I snatched it up. One of its decorative protruding leaves containing three barrels was missing. I could contain myself no longer. You blackheart! You have destroyed it! Dishonoured me! You villain! Where are the jewels? Where are the jewels you have stolen? Stolen? Yes, you thief! Where are they? There are none missing. There cannot there be. There are three missing. Must I call you a liar as well as a thief? Did I not see you trying to tear off yet another piece? You have called me names enough. And I will stand it no longer. I will leave the house in the morning and make my own way in the world. You shall leave in the hands of the police. I shall have this matter probed to its conclusion. Then call them, father. And let them find what they can. They shall learn nothing from me. The whole establishment was astir by now, and Mary rushed in, followed by two of the older housemaids. When Mary saw the coronet and Arthur, she gave a scream and fell to the ground. I sent one of the housemaids for the police, instructing the other to tend my niece. Arthur stood silent and white-faced near the wall until the arrival of the inspector and constable, and then asked if I intended to charge him with theft. I replied that as the ruined coronet was national property, the law must be evoked. At that point, he told me that it would be to both our advantages if he were to be allowed to leave the house for five minutes. I asked him once more to tell me what he had done with the missing stones, and that if he did so, all would be forgiven and forgotten. His reply was that I should keep my forgiveness for those who asked for it. Shortly after, I gave him into custody. This morning, he was removed to a cell, and I have now hurried round to you. The police confess they can make nothing of it. There is already a reward of a thousand pounds. Mr. Holmes, I have lost my honour, my gems and my son in one night. What am I to do? Uh, Watson, my cherry wood pipe from behind you, if you mm. will, old fellow. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Holder, do you receive much company? None, save my partner and his family. Occasionally, we would meet a friend of Arthur's who would call. Sir George Burnwell, for instance. Of course, you are right, Doctor. Sir George has spent a great deal of time with the house lately, so much so that I was tending to overlook him completely. And do you, in turn, go about much in society? No, I'm afraid Mary and I are very much homebirds, although she has been going up to town a little more recently. How old is Mary, Mr Holder? Uh, like four and twenty, I believe. And had little to do with the world and its ways. This matter seems to have shocked her a great deal. Terribly. And she will not, for some reason, hear of Arthur being guilty. You yourself have no doubt. But how can I? I saw him holding the coronet. No, but surely the coronet was twisted due to having the piece snapped off. What if Arthur was simply trying to straighten it? If his purpose were innocent, why did he not say so? And if guilty, why not invent a lie? There's something not quite right about his silence. You agree, Watson? Mm, absolutely. Could he have been protecting someone, Mr Holder? But who? 
I will vouch for my staff completely, except Lucy, whom Arthur has hardly spoken to in the short time she has been with us. Mm, what did the police think of the noise that woke you from your sleep? It was Arthur closing the dressing room door. Oh, well, if so, he would be the first fellow who ever knowingly slammed a door to awake a household. <laughs> Yes, and the disappearance of the gems? They uh, are still sounding the planking and probing the furniture in the hopes of finding them. And outside? That too, Doctor. Searching every inch of the garden. Mr Holder, is it not obvious that this matter strikes very much deeper than you or the police were at first inclined to think? Uh, considered as what's involved by the theory to which you and the police hold, that is, that your son left his bed, went at great risk to your dressing room, opened your bureau, took out the coronet, snapped off a small portion containing three jewels, then went to some other place to conceal this portion with such skill that nobody can find it, and finally returned with the other 36 barrels to a room where he stood the greatest danger of being, and indeed was, discovered. Now, is, Mr Holder, such an explanation tenable? But what other is there? That it is our task to find out. So now... We will set off for Streatham, where we will perhaps devote an hour to glancing a little more closely into details. My friend insisted on me accompanying them in their expedition, which I was eager enough to do, for my curiosity and sympathy were deeply stirred by the story to which we had listened. And so, after a short railway journey and an even shorter walk, we stood in front of Fairbank, the residence of the great financier. It was a square, good-sized dwelling, a little from the road, and with a double carriage sweep stretching down to two large iron gates. On the right side of the house was a small wooden gate which opened to a path to the tradesman's entrance, while on the left ran a lane to the stables, which was a public, though little-used, thoroughfare. We entered the gates and walked slowly towards the front of the house. Then, shortly before we reached it, Holmes left us, saying he intended to walk completely round the building. Holder and I waited for a time for him, but feeling the cold, Holder suggested we go inside. We therefore entered the house, made our way across the mosaic flooring, and into the dining room where we took a chair in silence by the fire. Suddenly the door opened and a young lady came in, rather above middle height and with dark hair and eyes, which the extreme pallor of her skin rendered even darker. In her early twenties, I thought, and distraught to a high degree, her eyes red and swollen with crying. This I assumed to be Holder's niece, Mary. Disregarding my presence entirely, she went straight to her uncle and passed her hand over his brow with what seemed to be genuine affection. Uncle, is Arthur released yet? Have you given orders he should be liberated? No, no, Mary. This matter must be fully probed. But I am so sure he is innocent. You know what women's instincts are. Then why is he so silent? Uh, I don't know. Perhaps he is angry that you should suspect him at all. But how could I not suspect him? Caught red-handed with the damaged coronet in the dead of night. Perhaps he just picked it up to look at it. Perhaps someone else had dropped it. Oh, do take my word for it. Let the matter go and say no more. I shall never let the matter go. Not until the gems are found. Never. Oh. I am sorry, my dear, but your affection towards Arthur blinds you to the possible awful consequences to me. In fact, I have brought a gentleman down from London to inquire into it. This gentleman here? No, this is his colleague, Dr Watson. Your sorry, Miss Holder. The gentleman in question is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes? Ah, Miss Mary Holder. I do have the honour of addressing Miss Mary Holder, do I not? Miss hmm. Holder, given the small amount of time we have and the magnitude of the task, I wonder if I might immediately ask a question or two in order to establish the possible guilt or innocence of parties concerned in this matter. All you want, Mr Holmes, if it will succeed in proving what I feel to be true, that my cousin Arthur is blameless. An opinion you will be pleased to hear, I share. Now to begin, you heard nothing yourself last night during the period the theft took place. Not until my uncle began to shout loudly at Arthur. Then I came down. Mm. Uh, you lock up of an evening, I believe, Miss Holder, so last night it was you who secured all the windows and doors. Yes. Yes, and they were all fastened this morning. Yes. However, your uncle told myself and my associate, Dr Watson, that he saw you late last night at the window that leads to the stable lane. I had been to lock the kitchen door when I saw Lucy, the maid, slip in through it. 
I went to the side window to see, if possible, where she had been. Looking out, I saw a man at the far end of the path in the gloom. You recognised him? Frank Prosper, the greengrocer. Hmm. Still, it is nothing for a young girl to wish to see her young man, is it? Except, I remember Lucy round and about the drawing room when Uncle was telling us of the coronet. I see. You infer she may have gone out to tell her sweetheart about the jewels and so plan a robbery with him? These vague theories, Mr Holmes, when I have told you I saw Arthur himself with the coronet in his hand. You have not answered my question, Miss Holder. Are you inferring Lucy and her sweetheart are responsible for the theft? I am telling you what I saw, Mr Holmes. I find it difficult to visualise, Miss Holder, especially as Prosper has a wooden leg, does he not? Why, Mr Holmes, however could you know that? He has his methods, Miss Holder, to reach the truth, however deeply it may have been buried. And now we shall go upstairs. Our first stop was the hall, where Holmes halted to walk swiftly round all the lower windows, opening the one leading to the stable lane and closely examining its sill with his lens, after which we proceeded to the dressing room from which the coronet had been taken. This was a plainly furnished little chamber with a grey carpet, large bureau and a dressing table with a long mirror. Holmes immediately went to the bureau and stared hard at it for a time. Uh, Mr Holder, which key was used to open the lock? The key to the lumber room, one of those my son mentioned. Uh, it's over there on the dressing table. Uh, uh, it's almost noiseless. No wonder it did not wake you. It, and this, I take it, is the case containing the coronet. We must have a look at it. May I? Good heavens. Now, Mr. Holder, here is the corner which corresponds to that which has been so unfortunately lost. Might I beg that you would break it off? Mr. Holmes, I should not dream of trying. Well, then I will try. Oh, <coughs> no. <coughs> yes, no, even though I'm exceptionally strong in the fingers. And, and what do you think would happen if I did manage to snap it, hmm? Watson? Crack like a pistol shot, I should think. Exactly, which would certainly carry a few yards to where you slept in the next room, Mr. Holder. So why did your uncle not hear this noise, Miss Holder? I... I am perplexed. Indeed. Your son had no shoes or slippers on when you saw him? No, nothing but his trousers and shirt. Thank you. Oh, we've certainly been favoured by extraordinary luck during this inquiry, and it'll be entirely our own fault if we do not clear it up. So now, with your permission, I shall continue my investigations outside and alone. Miss Holder, I will see you later. Oh. Watson, I shall find you... Why, uh, with me in the drawing room, I hope. Taking tea? Ah. In which place, if I may, I will eventually join you. After Holmes had left, Holder and I made our way downstairs for some refreshment. We asked Miss Holder to join us, but pleading a headache, she instead went off to her room. For more than an hour, Holmes was absent, finally appearing at the door, his feet heavy with snow, his features as inscrutable as ever. I think I have now seen all there is to see, Mr Holder, and can now serve you best by returning to my rooms. What? But, but, Mr Holmes, the, the gems, where are they? I cannot tell. Th then my, my son... Can you give me no hope on any score? Call upon me between nine and ten tomorrow morning, and I will do what I can to clarify the position. And, Mr Holder, I am to understand, am I not, that you give me carte blanche to act for you? That there's no limit on the sum I may draw as long as I recover the stones? I would give my fortune. Oh, very good, very good. Uh, Watson, let us collect our coats. As always, there is much to do and little time in which to accomplish it. It was not yet three when we found ourselves in our rooms once more. So quickly had Holmes seemed to come to grips with the case. And indeed, once back inside 221B, he immediately vanished into his bedroom, whence he emerged a few moments later, dressed as a common loafer. And with his shiny cedic coat, his red cravat, and his exceedingly worn boots, he was a perfect sample of that class. Stopping at the sideboard on his way to the door, he cut a slice of beef, put it between two pieces of bread and placed it in his pocket. I inquired where he was going. He indicated that it was to purchase some new footwear and then, with a twinkle in his eye, abruptly left. 
I sighed and settled before the fire, toasting both a muffin and myself. And then, what with the early beginning to the day, the cold outside, the heat inside, well, before I knew it, it was tea time and Holmes burst in swinging an old elastic-sided boot in one hand. Then, after informing me he had been back to Streatham, amongst other places, he went to his room, changed into his regular clothing, poured himself a cup of tea, borrowed my service pistol and vanished again. And the next time I saw him was the following morning at the breakfast table, and fresh and trim as possible. Uh, well, excuse me beginning without you, Watson, mm. but you remember our client has an early appointment this morning. Mm. Mm. In fact, I shouldn't be surprised if that were he. Uh, come in. Some coffee, old fellow. Yes. Uh, here, let me. Ah, Mr Holder. Mr Holmes, Dr Watson. Uh, Mr Holder, what on earth? Oh, gentlemen, I must sit. I have become an old man overnight. And I see from your expressions that I must now look like one. Here, Mr. Holder, join us, I beg you. Some coffee. Thank you, Dr. Watson, thank you. My dear sir, what has happened? What has happened is that two days ago, I was happy and prosperous without a care in the world, while now I am left to a lonely and dishonored old age. My niece, Mary, has deserted me. My dear. I sir. wanted to speak to her this morning. The servants couldn't find her. Her bed had not been slept in, and this note was lying on the hall table. Oh, uh, Watson, would you? Hmm. Dearest Uncle, I feel I have brought this trouble on you, and that if I had acted differently, this terrible misfortune might not have occurred. I cannot, with this thought, be ever again happy under your roof and feel that I must leave you forever. Do not worry about my future, for that's provided for. And above all, do not search for me, for it will be a fruitless labor. In life or in death, I am your loving Mary. Sir Holmes, do you have any idea what could have happened to her? What does this mean? What it means, Mr. Holder, is that the best of all possible solutions has occurred. But are you mad, Mr. Holmes? Why, this note may imply that she has killed herself. Yes, she may well have done, but not in the way you think. Mr. Holder, the first thing for me to say is that for some time now there has been an understanding between your niece and Sir George Burnwell. What? My Mary? Impossible. No, I'm afraid it's certain. Neither you nor your son knew the true character of this man whom you admitted to your family circle. A ruined gambler, a desperate villain, a man without heart or conscience, and very much the sort of man your niece would know nothing of but who would have quickly observed her naivety and how easy it would be to make her his tool by breathing those same vows to her he has breathed to a hundred others. I don't know what eventually passed between them. I do know that by the night of the robbery she was completely in his hands and in the habit of seeing him nearly every evening. Ah, the whole window. Correct. Uh, you recall, Mr Holder, how you came downstairs that night to check the house was secure and caught your niece at the hall window. She immediately spoke of Lucy having been outside in order to lull any sense of suspicion that you might have had. But what had really happened was that your niece had been speaking through the window to Sir George Burnwell and had told him, uh, no doubt as a piece of lover's gossip, of the coronet. He, however, immediately saw his chance in bending her to his will, persuaded her to help him steal it. This is terrible. Awful. How, how can I believe it? I, I always thought I knew that Mary loved me. And so she did, and still does, as no doubt she still loves Arthur. But there are women in whom the love of a lover extinguishes all other loves, and Mary, I think, falls into this category. Hmm. But to continue with my narrative, your niece had given Sir George Burnwell the information about the coronet. He ensnared her into stealing it and passing it out of the hall window to him. All of which would have gone to plan, except your son, Arthur, was uneasy that night with his gambling debts hanging over him, and lying awake heard the soft tread of his cousin Mary passing his door. Looking out, he saw her entering your dressing room. He slept on some clothes and waited until she emerged with a coronet, followed her downstairs and saw her pass it out through the window and then slip back to her room. He took no action against her, as this would have meant him being responsible for the exposure of the woman he loved. But as soon as she left the scene, Arthur threw open the window and vaulted out. He caught up with Sir George at the end of the lane where a struggle ensued for the jewels. Something snapped and your son found himself holding the coronet. 
He rushed back inside, slamming the hall window and then up to your dressing room, where, simply thinking the coronet twisted, he was trying to straighten it when you came in and accused him. Good heavens, is this possible? Which, of course, is why he wanted to go out for five minutes, to look for the missing piece. Indeed, and also why Miss Holder fainted when she saw the scene between Arthur and his father, not because of any rush of horror at the scene, but because she realised Arthur must know the sequence of events... And the part she played in them. Hmm. And yet my brave boy still quietly accepted my blame. Who was ever a father so blind? Oh, Arthur, what have I done? Your son, Mr. Holder, was fully and rightly expecting your thanks. Instead, you had him arrested. Dr. Watson, I wonder, is there any more coffee? Mm, Let me have your cup, Mr. Holder. Of course, I knew nothing of this when I arrived at the house. What I did know was that snow had fallen heavily in the recent past and had then frozen. Snow bears readily definable imprints of boots, shoes and feet, and freezing records them. I therefore made it my immediate business to walk right round the house to discover what I could. In the tradesman's path was a simple story. A woman's prints and another set, round at one side. A female had spoken with a male with a wooden leg. I I assume this was the maidservant and her greengrocer and gave them no more thought, notwithstanding your niece's constant effort to throw suspicion on them. The stable path, however, told a far more sinister and complicated tale. A double line of tracks of a booted man going to, then coming from, the side window. Then a a second double line of naked feet, in part, over the prints of the boots. I followed both these sets of prints to the end of the lane. There the snow was all cut up, as if a struggle had taken place. There were also a few bloodstains on the ground. Then Boots, as we shall call him, went on by himself, while naked footprints turned back to the house. I followed Boots a few more yards down the lane to the pavement, where another bloodstain told me it was Boots who had been cut in the melee, at which point I made my way back to examine the inside of the property, and especially the hall. I recall you seem to pay great interest to the sill of the side window. Well, I found the imprint of a bare foot, which in turn enabled me to reach an initial conclusion. A man had been waiting outside the house. Somebody had brought him the gems. This deed had been overseen by someone with bare feet who pursued and struggled with a thief for the coronet. But I had to ask myself, who was this opponent? And who had brought the coronet to the window to give to this opponent? And, and who had given chase? And the pursuer was obviously your son, whom you'd already described as only wearing trousers and shirt. But what of the identity of the other? This is fascinating, Mr. Holmes. Shocking, but fascinating. So what then? It's an old maxim of mine that when you've excluded the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Now, I knew it was not you who brought down the coronet, which left your niece and the maids. But if it were one of the maids, your son would not allow himself to be accused in her place, which left only your niece, whom Arthur loved and would therefore naturally want to protect. But who was her confederate? Hmm? A lover, certainly, for who else could outweigh the love and gratitude she felt for you? But as she never went out and you hardly received, how could she have met this lover unless it was a friend of your son's? Sir George Burnwell. Yes, a man known as bearing a highly doubtful reputation among women. And if I could prove he owned the boots which fitted the imprints in the snow... So you came home, donned a disguise and called on him. Brilliant. Not quite, Watson. Initially, I called on his man, offered to purchase a pair of Sir George's cast-off boots, and then took one of them to Streatham to try it against the footprint. And it fitted? Perfectly. Holmes, you excel yourself. Well, you may be right, Watson, you may be right, but I still wanted a final check. If Boots were Sir George, this would mean he'd sustained a wound. So again, I came home, changed my clothes, borrowed your pistol, and went to call. But this time on Sir George himself. And... As my own man. A uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes to see you, sir. Thank you, Johnny. I think I recognise you. That'll be all for the moment. Come in, Mr. Holmes. You'll take something, I trust? Johnny, that will be all. I've seen that cove somewhere before, come. My God, Johnny, if I could meet your wages, I'd turn you off tomorrow. I'll tell you, I've seen him. Johnny, that will be all. Uh, well, if you won't take any notice of me, that's all right, then. There's a distinct servant problem these days, Mr. Holmes. Now, Madeira? A nasty cut, Sir George, over your eye. A slip on the ice. It's very easy for one to lose one's footing in uncertain conditions. Which is why one should always be sure of keeping a supply of excellent footwear to hand. (laughs) 
I, in fact, purchased a pair of your old boots earlier today from your servant. Really? Mm. Their workmanship was quite unique, quite unmistakable in size and cut, I should imagine, to anyone really interested in identifying them. I might add, I was dressed as a loafer. You could have been dressed as the King of France and you would still have got them off Johnny, providing you had ready money. You are sure you will not join me? I then took one of those boots to the house of my client, a Mr Holder of Streatham. I believe you're on varying degrees of intimacy with the members of his family. While there, I tried your boot against some footprints left in the snow by a, a nocturnal visitor to the house the previous evening. The match was perfect. Good enough to bring a prosecution in any court in the land. Indeed! Sir George, if you insist on taking that life preserver down from the wall to show me, I shall insist on taking out my service revolver to show you. You know, Mr Holmes once heard a great deal about you. All of which, unfortunately, seems to be true. However, one thing you will not do is prosecute. Neither you, nor he who employed you, nor those beyond him would countenance the scandal. Which leads us to a stalemate, I think. A prosecution would not be in the public interest, I agree. However, I can inform you I have carte blanche to deal with you for the missing object. I propose £1,000 a piece for the stones you hold. That is to say, give what? me the missing piece. Three thousand? Three thousand? Dash it all, Mr Holmes. I've been done. I let him go six hundred the job lot. Now, tell me truthfully, there's a good fellow. Was ever a man's luck as bad as mine? What an unmitigated scoundrel. Mm, perfectly dreadful. And little remains to be said. For a consideration, oh, rather a large one, Sir George provided me with the name of his receiver in Seven Dials, from whom, after much chaffering, I got the stones at a thousand apiece. Oh, you then mean... looked in upon your son, told him all was resolved, and eventually got to my bed at two o'clock after what I may call a hard day's work. There is the missing piece. Uh... Now you have your chequebook. Three thousand, I believe, uh, plus the matter of the reward. Very reasonable, Mr. Holmes. A pen, uh, Mr. Holmes. Uh, thank you, Doctor. A day that has saved England from a terrible public scandal. I owe you a great deal, Mr. Holmes. A great deal. More than anything you owe me, Mr. Holder, is what you owe your son. A very humble apology to a noble lad. I speak the truth, Mr. Holder, when I say I would be proud if any son of mine had behaved as Arthur has in this affair. Yes, yes, of course. I must fly to my dear boy to apologise for the wrong I have done. He will come in with me to the firm. I shall begin again with him. Hmm. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Dr. Watson, thank you from the bottom of my heart. No, 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 no. don't ring, I beg you. I shall see myself out. you your skill has exceeded all that I have heard of it, Mr. Holmes. Can it possibly inform me where Mary is now, I wonder? I think we may safely say that she is wherever Sir George Burnwell is. It is equally certain, too, that whatever her sins are, they will soon receive a more than sufficient punishment. In The Beryl Coronet, Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Madison and Dr. Watson by Michael Williams. Alexander Holder was played by Anthony Newlands and his son Arthur by Angus Wright. With Petra Markham as Mary, Ian Lindsay as Johnny and Timothy Carlton as Sir George Burnwell. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The violinist was Leonard Friedman. The Beryl Coronet was dramatized for radio by Vincent McInerney and directed by Enid Williams.